All right, in Genesis chapter 6. All right, I, now we've already explained verses uh, uh, 8 and 9 uh, together, these two verses, and how these two verses are very helpful to understand dispensations. Okay? Um, there's no doubt that Noah lived uh, in a different dispensation than, than we do today. He found grace, absolutely. And uh, there's grace in every dispensation. We've, we've already looked at it and found that. But Noah's salvation was set up in a faith and work system. Okay? Now, uh, now was he saved? How was he saved? Well, he was saved by building a boat. Okay? It depended on that. Now, you, you say, well, why would that show his work? Because if Noah had not built a boat, you think he would have been saved? No, he would have died in the flood. So that's pretty, that's pretty simple. Now, and look at Hebrews chapter 11. Hold your place here in, in Genesis chapter 6. But look at Hebrews chapter 11. Look at a verse here. Now, in a Bible study, we, we do a study, uh, we compare Scripture with Scripture. That's how you know that things are true in the Bible, is uh, comparing, the Bible says to compare Scripture with Scripture. And so, now, Hebrews chapter 11, it talks about Noah here. Now, some people who deny dispensational truth or deny dispensational salvation, when they look at Hebrews 11... They'll claim that the Old Testament saints were saved by faith. And that's true. But something accompanied their faith. Okay? Now, in order for you to be saved, all you have to do is accept Christ as your personal Savior. And that takes care of your salvation. You're saved by grace through faith and not of works, lest any man should boast. But it wasn't that way with Noah. Noah lived under a, a different dispensational period of time, okay? And so, uh, their faith was based on what they did or what they did not do, okay? Now, when you're saved by grace through faith, your works are not added. Now, why not? Because the only work that matters is what work Christ did on the cross. So, what you have to remember is that it, when Noah was there, Christ hadn't died on the cross yet. So salvation could not have been grace only, no works involved like yours is. Does that make sense? All right, so you, we've got to keep that in mind while we're looking at that. Christ hadn't died, so it, it's, uh, there was no work of Christ being done. So in Noah's time, Christ had not yet died, obviously. So Noah's works were involved with his faith. When he built an ark for his salvation, that took five years of hard labor. He had to work hard to do that. Now look at Hebrews chapter 11, look at verse 7. By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, in other words, the flood hasn't happened yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark, to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. Faith, right? And so it says that he prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. Now, his work accompanied... His faith. Okay? And now verse 7b uh, says that he prepared an ark. His faith by his works saved him. Now, if he had not built that boat, he would not have become heir of the righteousness. Okay? That righteousness, you see, his righteousness, which is by faith. That's what it says. Right? Right? But he chose to be separated from the lost world, Noah did, by building an ark. Now, he knew everybody was going to ridicule and mock him. Why do you need to build a boat? We've never seen rain, right? And they mocked him. 
Uh, otherwise, he would have been condemned with the world, and he would not have drowned. He would have drowned along with his family. And, but he didn't do that. He went on ahead and built the boat. He, uh, according to this verse, he moved with fear. Why? God warned him. Now look back at Genesis chapter six, and look at verse nine once again. He says, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. Now, so I've explained this part last time in our Genesis study, but notice once again, he's a just man. He's just. And he's perfect. Now, perfect, just, just to allow you to remember, does not mean sinless. All right? Uh, perfect means complete. All right? But God said he's a just man and he's perfect and it's based on his walk with God. Okay, it's, that's what it's based on. Now this is not a justification or perfection that is similar to what you have, Christian. Noah had to go by a justification and perfection by man's righteousness, not God's righteousness. Now you're probably thinking there's no such thing as a just and perfect person by their own righteousness. You're absolutely right. That's true. But God considers it that way. Now why couldn't it be in God's righteousness? Because God had not died yet. God had not sent Jesus to die on the cross. See, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, it became His righteousness. That's why you can't get to heaven based upon anything that you do. It, it has to be, why well, he did it. it he's, the Bible's, now we'll, we'll look at the scripture, but it says that Christ is the end of the law for what? Righteousness. See? And so Christ was the end of the law for righteousness. That means it, it, your righteousness isn't based on anything. That's why you can accept the work of Christ did on the cross and get to go to heaven. And it's not by any works that you have. So God considers it that way. God judges them by man's righteousness, not his righteousness. Why? Because Christ had not yet died on the cross. When Christ died on the cross, he made a legitimate standard of righteousness for the world. What's the standard? Christ's righteousness. Right? There was no Christ's righteousness before Christ died. It was all based upon man's righteousness that got him somewhere. And so the legitimacy and standard for righteousness was Christ's blood. That's what he... Now look at Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. I'm trying to show you that there was a different dispensation where Noah's righteousness was counted for him doing the right thing. It was grace plus his works, his righteousness. But it's not that way today. Thank God, God made it easy for us. Luke chapter 1, and look at verse 6. Now, now let's back up to 5, get the context. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiah, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Now we know the story, but look what God says here. And they were both righteous before God. You see that? Walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. You see that? They were blameless. The Bible considers Zacharias and Elizabeth blameless based on their walk with God, just like he did with Noah. And, and he says they were both righteous before God. Now, it wasn't righteous because it was God's righteousness. No, it was their own righteousness. And notice, this is before Christ was even born. All right? Now, now turn to Ezekiel 14. Ezekiel chapter 14. Ezekiel 14. And see, now we're gonna, what we're going to do with Ezekiel 14, we're going to contrast this with Romans chapter 10. 
So uh, turn to Ezekiel 14 and Romans chapter 10, if you would. Now, there are many, there, there's too many verses in the Bible that prove this, okay? We're just picking two out, all right? But, but notice what it says here. Ezekiel 14 is the bombshell to prove this, all right? Uh, look at Ezekiel 14 and verse 14. Ezekiel 14, 14. Though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they should deliver but their own souls by whose righteousness? Christ's righteousness? No, their own righteousness. So Noah, Daniel, and Job, they had their own righteousness. Okay? And saith the Lord, now that's not in there once. That's in there three times in this chapter. Okay? Uh, it's there in verse 14, and verse 20 talks about it. And then it says, and these three men, uh, it's, it's in there like three times. Oh, verse 16, 14, 16, 18, and 20 actually. Talking about all three of these men. Now, now, now see that? Now, it, it, uh, once again, it does not say God's righteousness. It says it's their own righteousness. And notice they delivered their own soul by their own righteousness. You and I can't do that. Amen? We have to have Christ's righteousness in order for us to get to heaven. We have to rely on His righteousness. Now, that's the opposite of what Romans chapter 10 says. See, you Christians are not saved that way. You're saved by Christ's righteousness, not your own. Romans chapter 10, verse 3. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. You see that? See, God condemns those today who rely on their own righteousness. Why? They're as filthy rags, it says it, right? The Bible says that in Jeremiah. Their righteousness are as filthy rags. And so God condemns that. Why is that? Look at verse 4. For Christ is the end of the law, for righteousness to everyone that believeth. That's how you're saved. Therefore, Christ, when he died on the cross, he became the end of the law for righteousness. You rely on his righteousness now. See, the indication here means that there was a time period of the law for righteousness. The Mosaic law, it was based on their righteousness. But what about Mo Now, that was during Moses' time. Now, Noah was before the Mosaic law. And Noah, he had to go by the law of his conscience. And the laws God set up with Noah in chapter 9 of Genesis. All right? So right now, if, you, if you're saved, you're, it's because you're saved not by your own righteousness, but what Christ did on the cross. Noah, see, he had to count on his own righteousness too. So did Abraham. So did Moses. Right? That's why it says, and Abraham, it was imputed to him for righteousness. See, he had to do something for it. All right? Just obey God. Love God enough to obey him. Now, back to Genesis chapter 6. Now, this teaching is not taught in the majority of Christian churches today, and even in really independent fundamental churches. Because what are we talking about? We're talking about salvation in two different dispensations. Noah, God told him, build a boat. If he didn't build a boat, he would have been condemned with the rest of the world and would have died in the flood, right? We wouldn't have called it Noah's flood. There would have been no Noah, right? But he, he built a boat to the saving of his house. It says there in Hebrews 11. And so that's, that, that's why Christians today are very shallow in doctrine, because these things are not taught. Uh, 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 churches are, they don't get too deep into doctrine anymore. Why? Doctrine divides, and it does. It's going to show you whether you're a Bible believer or not. 
if you believe the Bible, what does the Bible say? Is the Bible uh, the, the uh, final authority in all matters of faith and practice in your life? If it's not, then you're not a Bible believer. Amen? And that's how you know. All right, now, uh, now we're done with that. Genesis chapter 6, look at verse 10. And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now, pretty self-explanatory verse. I don't think I have to go in and discuss the whole thing. But uh, uh, we, we once again meet this trio. When listed together, they're always listed in this order. Now, this is not the order of birth. Okay? And now, that's very important. Shem is not the firstborn. Okay, now let's look at that for a second. But when listed together, God always mentions Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Always in that order. Look at chapter 5, verse 32. And Noah was 500 years old, and Noah begat Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Look at chapter 10, verse 1. Genesis 10, 1. Now these are the generations of the son of Noah. Of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Look at chapter 9 and verse 18. And the sons of Noah that went forth of the ark were Shem and Ham and Japheth. All right? Now, uh, now, like we said, this is the way God names them in this order every time. But Japheth is actually the oldest. Look at chapter 10, verse 21. Uh, Genesis chapter 10, verse 21, Unto Shem also, the father of all the children of Eber, the brother of Japheth the what? The elder. So he's the oldest. You, you, you see that? And so who's, who's the youngest? We'll look at chapter 9 and verse 24. Genesis chapter 9 and verse 24, And Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. Now, if you go into the preceding verses, that's, that was Ham. So Ham's the youngest, and Japheth is the older. Obviously, that would make Shem the middle son, right? Our common sense would just tell you that. I, you don't need a verse to back that up. There's not one anyway, but that's just, it's kind of obvious at that point. Now, Shem, of course, is the father of the Hebrews. Ham is the father of Africans, okay, that's, that's where they came from. And Japheth is the father of the Caucasians. Okay, now we'll get into all this uh, a lot later. Uh, this is where today's ethnicities or the races, the nationalities come from. Okay, um, basic sociology 101 even teaches that. Okay, uh, but then you have uh, these people today, they change the terms, right? They change the terms constantly. Why is that? Because no matter what term you come up with, it will be politically incorrect. All right? So we're, we're just going to leave it at that for now. And uh, we'll talk about it later on when we get to Genesis chapter 9 and 10. All right? And uh, chapter 9 and 10 actually proves it all to you. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, if you look at Ham and his children... Uh, a lot of them are found in African regions, okay? That's, that, that's just facts, okay? We're, we're not being racial or, or anything like that. That's the way God set it up. In fact, that's where Noah, that was the land grant Noah gave to his boys, okay? And so we'll get into that a lot later. We're not going to do that today. Now look at verse 11. Now the earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. All right, now notice here that God said the earth, the earth was also corrupt. Now, God didn't say the earth was corrupt. All right? He said it's also corrupt. Now, did you see that? That's why we hang on every word. So this word also is very important here. So not now now look at look back at Genesis chapter 6 and 
you'll see in verses 1 to 4 that, that man is corrupting themselves by intermingling with the fallen angels, right? So you have mankind that has corrupted themselves. I'm going to put man's, mankind's corruption. And not only that, in verses 4 to 7, he says that he's going to destroy not only man, excuse me, but beasts and creeping things and fowl of the air. Right? Why? They were involved in the corruption. All right? So we're going to say animals which covers bugs and creeping things. And so there is a corruption. That's where you get all your myths of centaurs and satyrs and, and succubi and all that, all that mythological junk, okay? And so this is where it comes from. And, but notice that it says, now the word also, what does it mean? Also means it's inclusive, right? It also, it includes something. Now, now watch this. So God said that the earth also was corrupt. Now we already know mankind corrupted themselves. And the animal kingdom corrupted themselves. Why they were, it's all the sin, right? But the earth was messed up in God's eyes also. There's something wrong with the earth as well, which is why God had to drown it out. Not just the inhabitants or the animals, but he had to destroy the land itself. Okay? Now this is pretty wild. The earth also was corrupt. The earth was filled with violence. Bloodshed, massacre, there's violence all over the earth. Now there's two possibilities here. Number one, the earth also was corrupt. Man, animals, and now the land. Man's corruption was that of what? Intermingling, right? And uh, like we've already talked about, verses 1 to 6, man's corruption. Verses 4 to 7, animals were part of the intermingling possibility. Or, or, and now it says the earth also. So something was going on where either mankind or the angelic beings was messing with the vegetation. All right? You, you ever had something like chloroform or something, something plant-like uh, put into your veins? I've heard of people that have injected plant life stuff into their veins. and uh, What is all this plant-based stuff in, uh, that you're eating now? And how you see how all that's, well, that's uh, for vegetarians. Fine. I'm not talking bad about it. But all this uh, plant-based stuff is coming about now. And it's, it's a, ver a very real, uh, it's a huge thing right now. I work at a grocery store, so I see a lot of it coming in. So, now, so it would be logical to say that there was an intermingling of the chromosomes or the DNA with plant life or vegetation. That, that's the indication here. The earth also, the stuff that was growing on land, God had to destroy it all. Why? Because there was something going on. Now, if we're talking about something scientific, we may be talking about something ridiculous, all right? But we're talking about angel biology intermingling with everything on earth, okay? There is fornication and adultery amongst everything. You already have the mutants and the giants, the men of renown, going around. How far-fetched is it to say that trees could walk and talk? Where do you think they get that stuff in Lord of the Rings about tree beard? And it's moving through the forest. Where do they get that stuff? Because, see, that's part of mythology. Where it, it was, it's possible it could have actually happened. 
Okay? Now that's the, the first thing. You see, the imagination of man is endless. Once you go to one step with fornication, you'll go to the next thing where it's same-sex marriage. And then you go to the next step, which is transgender. And then you go to the next step, bestiality. What's next? See, man's imagination it goes as far as the devil will allow it to go. And it never stops. It just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. And not only that, but see, this is angels. Having to, and they're teaching mankind to do all this. Yep. Yeah, and we have uh, uh, the, the human trafficking. That's a whole different thing there. But see, that's, that's all part of it. So, now the, now the second interpretation to this is that it could be based on, upon violence, not intermingling. Not intermingling the DNA of man with, with plant life, it could, but it could be through the violence also. Now, verse 11 does say, the earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So the earth, now, now notice this, now think about this. The earth was soaking up too much blood from the violence. Now I'm going to prove it to you. Scripture talks about the land. Now we can see in America how corrupt it's becoming. Now why would we say that, that it's becoming worse and worse? Because we look at the crime statistics every year and see that it's been going up every year, every five years, right? It just, the crime rate keeps going up. Crime was very high during the COVID situation. And when God says the earth was corrupt, it's because he's looking at the murder, the crime, the violence that's being shed throughout the earth, right? And look how bad it is today. Now, now turn to two places. Turn to Genesis 9 and Numbers 35. Genesis chapter 9 and Numbers 35. Now, if there is a sin that God takes seriously, it's murder. Now, He takes every sin seriously, all right? Sin is sin. But God puts a capital punishment on murder. All right? Over lying. <laughs> okay? Uh, so God takes it very seriously. In fact, murder is such a heinous sin that it doesn't matter what political belief you are or you have or what religion you are, everyone knows it's wrong. And even that's being uh, dumbed down with the murder of babies and abortion. See? How it, euthanasia, right? And so it's being done away with and kind of dumbed down where it's, it's not man's life for man's life anymore. We'll never be back to that again. But look at Genesis chapter 9 and look at verse, uh, verse 5. And surely your blood of your lives will I require. At the hand of every beast will I require it, and at the hand of man. At the hand of every man's brother will I require the life of man. You kill someone, that life's going to be required. All right, he's to be put to death as well. That's the way God set it up with Noah. Now, it's, but notice here in verses 4 and 5, did you notice that it's not just humankind? It's the animals too. Did you see that? So that proves that mankind and animals were both corrupt. Why? Because God had to make a law against it. Because of what happened before the flood. So God told Noah, th this is what it is. A man's life is a man's life. And if, uh, if uh, animal life or an animal's life. He set it up that way. So capital punishment for murder. Now look at Numbers 35 and look at verse 33. Oh, uh, let's back up to verse 31. Numbers 35, 
verse 31. Moreover, you shall take no satisfaction for the life of a murderer, which is guilty of death, but he shall be surely put to death. Now, are we going to do that today? No. You know what we have to do? Just let it be. Let the court system handle it, and if they can't handle it, and they let him go free, we have to watch our backs, right? Because it's not yours and my job to go and take that life. And we'll get thrown in prison too, right? But now look at verse 33. So ye shall not pollute the land. Now notice, what's going on with the land? It's because of all the murder in the land. It pollutes the land. So ye shall not pollute the land wherein ye are. For blood, it defileth the land. And the land cannot be cleansed of the blood that is shed therein, but by the blood of him that shed it. You know how to cleanse the land from the blood? By killing the one that killed the person. That's the only way to clean the land. Why is America in the shape it's in? Because America has not been doing that. Look how many years. And uh, remember at what happened with Abel when he was murdered by Cain? It says that the earth cried out to receive his blood. His blood soaked into the, into the earth and it cried out for, Ad, at, for Abel's blood. Remember that? See, the, that's why with all the blood being spilt here, the earth was filled with violence. To the point the land was crying out to God. It's very interesting, isn't it? Not only that, but, that, but the Cain murdering Abel, that was the first public crime. It was murder. Genesis 4 verse 10. It cried out for Abel's blood being shed. And so the earth was starting to be corrupt. That's why God had to curse Cain for the ground that he's producing from. That's why he had to do that. Think about how much the earth is being cursed with all the blood in the land. And that's why there's food shortages today. Why is that? Uh, sure, people don't want to work. But it's because the land is, is being more corrupt because of the violence done with it. And we just let it happen. Our government just lets it happen. See, but Cain, he, he didn't till the ground anymore after he was, when he left, after God told him, right? Cain didn't care. What did he do? What did he, do? he produced a civilization instead. He never messed with the ground anymore. God had cursed it. He's not going to get anything out of the ground. He knew that. So he produced a civilization. And because he produces a civilization, they're all over the earth now, along with the violence. And the entire earth's ground is pretty much cursed, not just Cain. So now God has to cleanse the land with a worldwide flood. What? To get rid of the violence. From the earth. Back to Genesis chapter 6. See how all this fits? Man. That's why it doesn't matter when you argue about the climate change or global warming or the Green New Deal. It doesn't matter about any of that. It doesn't matter how much of the earth you protect. You'll never protect and produce a perfect earth. While sin is involved. You have to get rid of sin first. Does that make sense? When sin is gone, everything will be fine. But when will sin be gone? After this earth is renovated by fire. See, that's the end of the world. Now there's another thing I want to say about Genesis chapter 6 here. The theme of everything that mankind seeks after again and again is fornication and violence. You notice every single movie has to be action, adventure, and what else? Yes, romance. I, I say romance, but you get the picture. 
All right? It's all about fornication, action, and adventure. Over and over again. That's the theme. Well, we, we, we've got to have the ratings up, so we're going to add this scene in there. See that? And if there's no scenes, then we're not going to get the ratings, so we've got to add one or two. That's the theme of movies. Fornication, action, and adventure. And that's why Jesus Christ had to go to the cross. To make a comeback against death. That's why Satan has to imitate what Christ did in all the movies. You notice in Hollywood how there's a typology of the Antichrist or typology of Jesus Christ and what he did? Just to mess with Jesus Christ. Satan does that. So those are the two interpretations of verse 11. Now, there's a third interpretation, actually, and that's that it's both. That it could be both. Yes, violence, but also the intermingling as well. Now, here's another thing that's pretty interesting. When you read the ancient texts, especially Hinduism, they mentioned that the gods would fight with mankind before the worldwide flood. It says that in there. And that, where, and that there were also bombs and some sort of nukes going off. When? Before the flood. Now, now notice this. Now if I recall... Even Oppenheimer himself, who was heavily involved in building the atomic bomb, even mentioned the Hindu text. Now, I don't know if it's in the new movie coming out. I don't, I don't know. It may be. But, but he said the saying is, and, it's, and he quotes it, this is history, okay? He quotes the Hindu text saying, quote, Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. Unquote. Why? Because he built the atomic bomb. You know what that Hindu text is from? Before the flood. When it was written down in the Hindu text. Now, remember Genesis chapter 3 where Satan came to Eve and said, Ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil? See, the devil was starting all that stuff. Before, before the flood. Right there while Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden. Ye shall be as gods. Now, notice before the flood there was no polytheism. There was only monotheism. Why is that? Because there were no idols worshipped until after the flood. Now think about it. God's is mentioned as polytheism, not because of mankind making idols. No, man is considered to be a god. That's what Satan was teaching to Adam and Eve, right? And so he said that they were gods. You know what was going on? Genesis chapter 6, the gods were on the earth that time as the fallen angels. It wasn't an idol they were worshipping. No, they were worshipping those fallen angels. That's where polytheism uh, started. But it was because there was a true, live, heavenly, supposedly, I'm saying heavenly in quotations, right? They weren't heavenly after they fell. But there was a big spiritual presence there. And they worshipped that spiritual presence. And so there were gods coming down and humans trying to be gods. And that's why it makes sense when you read mythology. Where did it all come from? From those fallen sons of God. Now they're trying to say science is a god. They say humanism. You are a god. That's what it says. The new age teaching is there's a god inside you that you can attach yourself to. That's what, that's what they teach. You don't have a God living inside you unless you're saved. You've got the Holy Spirit, but that doesn't make you a God. You're still a sinner. All right? And anything righteous is because of what He's done, not because of what you've done. So you're not a God. When you get to heaven, you're not going to be a God. 
He is going to be the God. If you're going to become a God like uh, the other religions say that they will be, I think the JWs are the ones that say they hold the belief that they're going to be gods one day. But they're not going to be gods. They're going to still be bowing their knee to the Lord Jesus Christ if they're saved, if they even make it there. You see, this is the devil's doing. This is how the devil deceives. By, think, by making you think that you're going to be a god. Genesis chapter 4 through 6 is the best chapters to look at for current events today. If you want to know what, where we're headed as a nation, right here in Genesis chapter 4 through 6. Everything is a copycat. It's a pattern. It's like, a, like Enoch's rapture type of the church being raptured up. Noah, his walk with God type of the tribulation, having to go through the tribulation through the flood. It's a typology. It's a picture. Noah's generation, everything is imitating exactly as today. And what you see in Genesis, you actually see in Revelation. Everything's imitated in Revelation. And it hadn't even happened yet. And, and Christian, you have the Word of God in your lap to show you. We know the end of the book. We know what happens. And it should be a blessing to you that you've got something you can count on in your life. That's the final authority in all matters of faith and practice. Every problem you have, you can find it in the Bible. You can apply it to your life spiritually, not doctrinally, but spiritual application to make yourself a better Christian. You could take the, every verse in the Bible three different ways. Historically, because it actually happened. It's fact. It's history. Number two, you can apply it to your life, spiritual application. And you know what, number three? Sometimes you can take it doctrinally. Meaning, prophetically, for it may happen again down the road. Everything's a picture of something. Amen? Amen. God's good. And we, we get to go to heaven. <laughs> that's, that's the great thing. We get to one day see Jesus again, amen, and not be on the end of his wrath, but on the end of grace, standing behind him as he comes back, doing, doing, uh, battling everything, amen. We don't even have to lift a finger. We're not going to have to do it. We're just going to have to watch, watch him do wondrous things, amen. Let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that you're our God and that there's none beside thee. Lord, I'm not looking forward to becoming a God because, Lord, I'm nothing. Lord, you're everything. And, Lord, it's a blessing to know that, Lord, we're going to be with you for all eternity. We're going to get to see the wondrous things that you're going to do. And, Lord, we say tonight, even so, come Lord Jesus. That would end all of our problems here on earth. You'd take care of them all. We look forward to that day when you come back. Could be tomorrow, could be next week. We hope it's soon. Bless your people, Lord. We pray that you bless them this week. And uh, Lord, we pray that you give them blessings today.